Hello, everyone. Welcome to today's RD to RD live show. We are joined by a superstar media RD, Amy Gorin, tackling the topic of getting started. So, you know, whether it's private practice or creating a course, being a media RD, there's that big hurdle of the getting started, all the things that you don't know and oftentimes feels like you know, cozying up to a fire hydrant. What do you need to know? Um, what um, What are the most essential things to get started and really break into what can feel like a hard nut to crack, which is the world of being a media RD. So Amy, thanks so much for being here today. Thanks so much for having me. Yay. Um, so for everyone listening in, we are obviously here to take your questions as well. I have uh, prepared some for Amy, but if something comes up as she's, you know, answering questions, feel free to um, pop in in the comments and I'm going to uh, keep an eye on those. I'm uh, a little bit more adept at Facebook's new live video producer this time, so that'll that'll help things as well. All right, so to kick it off, Amy, tell us a little bit about your background as a dietitian and kind of how you got to where you are. Yeah, um, that's a great question. So I actually, um, being a dietitian is my second career. And my first career, I was a magazine editor. So I worked, um, I was a health and nutrition editor at Prevention and Health and Parents, American Baby and Weight Watchers. And um, somewhere along that way, I just figured out that I love nutrition. And so I started going back to school to become a, a dietitian. And it kind of, um, I always kind of figured I would combine the two worlds and um, work as a media dietitian. And so when I was finally done, um, I kind of just launched my own business and started entering the world of media diet, uh, being a media dietitian, which we'll talk about, you know, today. Um, and it's just, it's so much fun. It's so rewarding. You get to get your nutrition messages out to the masses, which is really what I love about it. Um, you know, obviously working one-on-one -on -one in private practice is fantastic, but getting your nutrition messages out to millions is really rewarding. Absolutely. And I, I love that your background, um, you know, you combined your experience in a way that, I mean, was perfect for your skills, your interests, and really pointing out that, you know, nutrition is such a versatile field. Um, and, you know, I imagine, I guess it'll be interesting. So you had a background in advertising. So I think I'd like to talk about maybe that element versus, you know, a dietitian who's maybe done things a more traditional way of, okay, I worked a couple of years in clinical, I don't have an advertising or a media background. Is it, you know, is that kind of a hopeless transition? How do you, we'll kind of yeah, talk about of what that is. Uh, so I, uh, so my background was in journalism. I, I did, had an undergraduate degree in journalism. I went to journalism grad school um, and obviously that helped a ton, but it's not mandatory. So um, I actually co-run a master of the media e-course to help train dietitians and other health professionals and get them into that world of being a media dietitian. And the steps are really seamless. Um, you know, if you, I always say, you know, people always come to me and ask, you know, I'm in school for being a dietitian right now. Is it, um, should I just wait years and years to, um, until I'm done? And so my answer is always, do it now. So when I was in school, it was a seven year process because I went part time and I started uh, doing media interviews and even calling myself a nutrition expert. I wasn't a dietitian, a full-fledged dietitian yet. And just getting your name out there, starting your social media platform, starting a blog, doing all of that background work to get name recognition and an audience is really what's gonna help you later on. Um, you know, even if you're a part-time dietitian now and you wanna do part-time media dietitian work, you can start doing that now. Good, like the, that tip getting started. Okay, <laughs> so the word media RD to me, what, what exactly is a media dietitian and do they all do the same type of work? So maybe um, kind of breaking that up a little bit to better you know, define the, the types that you might find under the umbrella of media RD. Yeah, so that's a great question. So a media dietitian is truly a dietitian working in the media. It's as simple as that. And it can mean so many different things. There's so many different types of media dietitians out there. So you can be a dietitian who writes freelance articles for websites, um, 
you know, like I myself write articles for Food Network and Everyday Health uh, about nutrition. You can be a dietitian who's on TV, you know, the Dr. Oz show or the Today Show or your local ABC or NBC station. You can be a, a dietitian who writes books. Um, there's a lot of dietitians running cookbooks these days, which is really exciting. Um, you can have a YouTube channel. You can have an Instagram live, you know, recurring episode every week. There's so many different ways. And a lot of dietitians who are media RDs will combine many of those things and, you know, write a book and have a TV show and write articles, but you don't have to do all of those. If you hate being on camera, you can still be a media dietitian. So I think there's that blurry line between I'm be a, I'm a freelance writer that they would you might say that that's kind of a subset of being um, a, a a media RD which for me a lot of the terms that get thrown around I'm gonna say oh a media RD in my mind I think of that person who comes on the six o'clock news and does a like mini cooking demo like that's a you know media RD so I think it's really interesting that you you know kind of provided that kind of put the scope around, at least for what we're talking about today. Yeah. And you don't even have to be a freelance writer. You can be um, a dietitian who gives quotes for articles. You know, you can do media interviews and have your name in outlets that way. So there's so many different options or you can do it all. Or like you mentioned, social media, as far as sponsored, you know, posts and things. But I, we're going to talk about the whole getting paid part um, in a little bit. But to talk about what does that look like um, and how do you end up taking this audience that you've been talking about and your expertise and, you know, making money from, <laughs> how do you actually yeah. make money from this, right? Yeah, so that's a question I get asked all the time is how, you know, do you make money as a media dietitian and do you get paid for everything you do? And the, the answer is you definitely make, you can make money as a media dietitian. Um, and that's, um, but you don't get paid for everything you do. <laughs> so I kind of make it, um, so I, I probably do about 10 to 12 media interviews a week. And so I literally carve out at least half a day. Sometimes it's a full day of just, you know, I don't literally sit in front of my computer for half a day doing it, but I divvy up the time. Um, and that's what I call my marketing budget because for the bulk of that, there's no compensation, but that gets my name out there so that sometimes brands will see me, they'll say, oh, I saw you in so-and-so article and we're interested in working with you as a spokesperson. And then that's how you make those bigger dollars. A lot of the time about it that name name recognition um yeah and i always see those comments often about you should never do anything for free as a as a dietitian and i i'm curious as someone who you know does make money as an media how do you how do you do that mentally as far as valuing okay the roi for different things where where's that line for you um because I think it's an it's a topic that gets a lot of people, you know, it gets a lot of comments. Yeah, that's a great question. And so personally, um, you know, early on, I actually had a mentor who told me, you know, never ever turn down a media interview. And I I try my hardest actually to stick to that to this day. I mean, obviously, I just moved into a new house this week, so I had to turn down a few things. There's life events that make it, so you have to turn things down. But then that's where I try and refer out to, oh, I can't take this on, but I have this network of other media dietitians, and you kind of refer out to each other. Um, but then the line gets a little complicated when, you know, say a food company comes to you and says, hey, um, we love your what you stand for. We want to feature you on our Instagram page um, with some quotes about, you know, why you love our product. And then that gets, you know, that's like where, okay, maybe that's where you draw the line of doing things for free. You know, the media outlet, if Love Strong comes to you and says, can you do a media interview? Obviously you're not getting paid by Love Strong for that. And you just do that to get your name out there. But the food company is kind of more or less using you in your platform to endorse their products. So that's something you should get paid for. Wow. And so, um, you know, obviously if you've just started and you have 300 Instagram followers and you want to build that, maybe you'll think about doing that just for a trade-off of growing your followers. But if you're established and you have, you know, 10,000 followers, maybe you shouldn't do that for free. So it's always kind of a toss up and you have to think about it strategically. And if you are going to do it for free, you know, what can you be getting out of it? Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, that's really good. I think it's interesting to hear different people's perspectives. Um, one of my favorite, you know, advice I, I got from a, from a boss at one point was suspend your disbelief. Um, we tend to, you know, 
like, oh my gosh, I can't believe, like suspend that for a moment and evaluate. Um, so I always try to do that whenever I have a strong emotional reaction. Okay, moment, Megan, suspend your disbelief here and yeah. objectively evaluate the, the situation. So. I think that's great advice. And a lot of times if I'm conflicted about something, you know, first of all, I have a mastermind group of other media dietitians. And so we'll kind of just bounce ideas off of each other. You know, should I do this? Or if I'm going to do it for free, like what, you know, what can I get out of it? Um, or sometimes I literally just sleep on it. And I know that I'm going to feel less emotional about a decision in the morning. Yes. <laughs> Excellent advice. So Let's talk about how most dietitians get started. Um, is there like a checklist? Okay, here's all the prerequisites and skills. I think we tend to think, well, I have to do X, Y, and Z before I can, you know, start seeing clients or start working, doing a brand interview or, you know, getting paid by a brand. How does this happen in, in the real world and what do you recommend? Yeah, that's a great question. I, uh, I mean, my advice is always just literally jump into it. So you might think, I think a lot of people put up their own obstacles. And, you know, if you say, okay, I want to start a private practice, but I need 10 paying clients before I can start a blog because no one's going to want to read my blog if I don't have any clients. And, you know, like you kind of just create these obstacles and I think just let all of that go. Um, I, for one, am always going to have, I have a forever to-do list of, you know, the, of wish list items. But jump into what you can. I mean, that's not going to be everything at once. But, you know, say if you want to start a new website, a blog, um, say you don't have Instagram and you've never posted on LinkedIn or Twitter, you know, pick two things to do this week. You know, look into a web designer for next week. You know, kind of just start checking those things off. Um, get a basic website up, even if you don't have a blog. The one thing I kind of see is um, people who want to work in media, The I'd say like the number one mistake I see is no easy way to contact those people. So even if they have a website, if the reporter goes to your website and has to spend more than a minute searching for your contact information or your media, um, social media platforms, they're gonna pass you over onto someone else. So even if you have literally a one page website with your contact information and links to your platforms, that's gonna even set you up for a lot better success as a media dietitian. Nice. Or if you already have a website, adding a page that's more dedicated to you know that type of work do you have any thoughts there is that a good idea yeah that's a great idea so um when you have the opportunity to build up your website i would recommend um having one page dedicated you know you probably already have a page dedicated to working with you one-on-one -on -one as a dietitian so have another page talking about spokesperson work and brand partnerships. And eventually that's also going to be the page that you'll disclose who you're working with because you want to be completely transparent to media outlets. And then also have, you know, a media kit, at least a link to your media kit on your website. And then once you start getting out in the media, I know this is a lot, right? <laughs> um, have a page that links to your media hits because that's also going to be something that a reporter will want to see. Okay, this person has experience working with the media or a brand will want to see, oh, this person's really good at media interviews. We might want to hire them to do media interviews on our behalf. So that just makes it a lot easier for people to want to hire you and work with you. Got it. And for people like the media kit or your, you know, your brand media kit, right, which has how elaborate does that need to be? And maybe give a little bit more background about yeah. what that is and what do you do when you're just getting started? You don't feel like you have much to, I guess, showcase. Yeah, so a media kit is, it's really just a one or two or three pager on uh, what your brand is all about, who you are, you know, a brief little bio, and then you can include your statistics and you don't have to include everything. So if there's one platform you just started on and you have a hundred followers, don't include that just include your impressive stats. So maybe you have, you know, 500,000 page views on Pinterest, include that. Or if your blog is doing really well, um, I, and then like, I always um, say to include little things that um, kind of highlight your expertise. So on my media kit, for example, I'll say how many articles I published last year, how many interviews I did over the last year, just because that's really a big part of my brand. But um, one thing, that is really going to help you create a media kit is Canva has some really awesome and easy to use templates. So that's, that's how I created mine. Um, and I have to say, you know, for the first couple of years I was doing this, I was overwhelmed by creating this elaborate, beautiful media kit. So I just had a one pager on my website 
just listing what I, my services and the highlights. And that's what I would refer to people to. So that can even be a quote unquote media kit that just serves as that it's a one pager. Um, so again, don't feel like you have to do everything at once. If a media kit is so overwhelming, just create a whole, a placeholder for now. Right. I think that's a really good point. You mentioned that, you know, one pager, like to get it out there to get started. Like if someone comes to your a potential reporter comes to your website, if you don't have a 10 page gorgeous media kit, you're going to be better off even if you just have one a one pager for them to look at and that we tend to like you mentioned put up our own roadblocks well I don't want to put a media kit together until I have x y or z so I think that's really sound advice about you know just getting you did it you had a one pager for a long time it worked for you (laughs) exactly and then one thing that I will recommend um so once you have that official media kit up there with your statistics it's a great thing to, so I actually have it linked to Dropbox and I upload it to Dropbox every single month. I update the statistics because, you know, if you only update it once a year, it's going to get outdated really quickly. Yes. It's a really, really good point. Um, and shout out Mackenzie says here, she just added a media page to her website. So yay. <laughs> great well job. done. Well done. Um, so to kind of go a little bit more, what else should you be I guess getting work and maybe things to do and then maybe things to be a little bit cautious of one from a getting paid point, maybe two from, you know, ethics or is it a good fit for my business? Some of these things as you're getting started, you're like, I'll take anything. Um, Maybe talking about finding that work in the beginning and some little nuggets. Yeah. So I think, um, you know, every, all of this is going to shift over the course of your career, you know, my first year of being a dietitian, I I was in that that realm of okay, I need to take you know I had the mindset of anything that is paid, <laughs> I need to take, and then I became more choosy over time because I had that luxury. Um, but you know, I would say the the most important thing is to establish a niche that really resonates with um, what you stand for as a dietitian. You know, so my area of expertise is I'm a plant based dietitian. And so over time, you know, the media interviews, if I have to say no to anything, I never say no to anything that's in that area. Um, But if someone comes and says, oh, hey, I want to interview you about, you know, keto diets. Well, that's not anywhere in my realm of expertise. So if I have the time and I can kind of angle it a little bit to maybe include some of my recipes, um, you know, I might take it, but I might also refer that media interview over to a uh, another dietitian who is more uh, focused in that. So that's one thing to consider. And then by doing that, by getting your name out about this area, you know, say you're a dietitian who meets with new mothers, then people are going to see that and they might say, hey, I want to hire this dietitian to be my dietitian, you know, especially since we're in pretty much a virtual world right now and you don't have to be located in the same city as your clients anymore. <laughs> that's, that's one thing that's yeah. I guess a bonus of the pandemic, if there is such a thing. So. <laughs> There's such a, you know, we call it a silver lining, right? Um, I guess my thoughts are, okay, so finding work. Um, you know, we have things like, of course, Paro, or if we're going to be doing freelance writing, we're pitching, you know, this can be a lot of time that you're spending, but maybe not seeing a lot of results. So maybe talking about, so if you're doing this, interview work. I'm looking at, okay, where are the dollar bills going to come from, right? I'm doing this interview. How do I harvest that as something that actually puts money in the bank? Yeah. So there's many ways to think about this. And I just want to backtrack one second, because you mentioned Tara, which is, um, if people don't know, that's Help a Reporter Out. It's a a service that you can sign up for and you get daily alerts a few times a day of um, media opportunities for interviews. So that's a great thing to sign up for. Um, but yes, so there's a few different ways you can kind of leverage this. Um, one is by always, always including a backlink to your website when you do media interviews. And so not just necessarily going back to, you know, your the name of your website. So my, my website, for example, amydgoren.com, I might do a backslash to uh, recipes if I want people to read my recipes, or I might do, um, I might get people specifically to the page where I talk about one-on-one private clients if I want to grow my private uh, practice, you know, at at the moment. So think about what 
the interview can do for you and angle the reach back to your website specifically towards your goals for that. So that's one way. Another way is don't ever let anything you do go to waste. <laughs> so, um, so one thing that just helps keep me organized, um, I have a document for every single year and I know like other di other media dietitians, some of them keep a document for every month. So you can do, do it however works for you. But I keep that document of every single media interview I do. So I, my 2020 is like 200 and something pages long. But that for one allows me to do quicker media interviews. I never copy and paste what I did, you know, last week or the month before, but I kind of can say, okay, I did this research already. I can reword this and give it to the new media outlet. I can also write, use that information to write a blog post. Again, not word for word copying. I don't want to plagiarize myself, but that's how I can- Not reinventing the wheel in your own exactly. work, right? Yeah. So, you know, I try and post every day on my blog and some people might say that's a lot of work and it is, but I'm reusing some of the, of the research I've already done. So I'm not starting from scratch. Wow. Wow. Do you sleep, Amy? <laughs> I do. <laughs> okay. Just checking. Just checking. <laughs> All right. So we kind of went back to, you know, how to harvest that into, you know, paying, right. Paying things, right. If you went back to this help a reporter out. So I do an interview for, you know, I respond to a reporter. You made a really good mention of posting on your blog. So, you know me, I'm someone who loves digital products and I know you have a little bit of a passion for digital products yes. as well, selling on Etsy, selling on RD to RD, that if you're doing these interviews and you're creating links back to your website, to your recipes, to your blog, actually using some of that for maybe making sales of your digital products, I'm just curious. Yeah, so that's a really great question. And I have, so um, you mentioned my, um, so I have an RD to RD store where I sell um, any, everything from meal plans to private practice forms. And then I also have an Etsy shop where, to be honest, I sell the same um, yes. products, but they're obvious, I've taken out the B2B products. And so my Etsy store, for example, it's called Plant Based Eats. And I have been linking to that in a lot of my media interviews. So we talked about the backlink. And so sometimes I have been successful in getting two backlinks, which I have to say is one of those things you cross your fingers for. And then I can leverage that to, okay, sometimes you're going to see, if you go to somebody's website, you'll see it as seen in section. So I have it on my website. I have the highlights of where I've been featured in the media, you know, Prevention Magazine, Women's Health, Men's Health, US News, those kinds of places. And then in my Etsy store banner, I've now started creating, creating the same as seen in section. So that's been a really great way to grow that storefront really quickly and to sell more digital products and make more passive income. Yeah, no, that's terrific. Um, I wanted to, you know, as my passion of right, you know, <laughs> digital products as you're looking at, yes, maybe you're doing brand work, which might be, you know, a little larger amount of money coming in. You might also be having traffic from other links that's maybe passive income. Of course, you know, that idea of creating more revenue streams, more opportunities. Exactly. And you can create, you know, think about the type of interview you're doing. So say I was doing a B2B interview for today's dietitian, I might include the backlink to my RD to RD store. But if I'm doing a consumer interview for women's health, it would make more sense to con to include the link to those consumer meal plans on Etsy. So yeah, kind of I think that was like a kind of a light bulb thing. And I, maybe I'm the only one, but being really thoughtful about the link you're providing because that's the ROI, right? I'm doing the interview, yes, to get my name out there, but that backlink is a huge element and, and making sure you put as much effort into what, do you, what am I choosing as you do into the content you provided. It's huge. And so it not only helps your SEO, it helps your um, getting those page views. And you know, if your goal is to be a part of a big ad network where you're getting $1,000 a month in ad revenue that can help you towards those goals. I do wanna caution though, um, because in our Master of the Media course, um, we, we get a lot of questions about the backlink and they're, you know, the backlinks are hugely important, but that is not the only value at all of a media interview. Um, so I have gotten, I mean, if we're talking money, you know, I've gotten those, those multi-figure partnerships um, by Let's talk about those. Let's saying, talk. you know, yeah. hey, I saw your quote and, you know, sometimes I'm asked to give product recommendations. And maybe I talked about a product that I just truly love and I buy myself, but the brand maybe saw that 
And they said, oh, well, you really, truly love our product and we want to hire you. And so that honestly does sometimes happen. And that's the bigger, you know, there's many, many benefits of the media interview, but I'd say that's probably the biggest one. Okay. So let's kind of segue a little bit because that happens, right? Even if you're not, you know, super established, you, you know, put a brand in your stories or in a post and they reach out to you what happens next? It's this opportunity where maybe they want you to do work for free or what, what should you do? Right? Yeah, that's a great question. So, I mean, and I have had offers from, um, Hey, we really want you to write a blog post about our our product and we'll give you a free coupon worth $3.99, $3.99, not the other kind of $3.99 for, um, for, you know, some product. And, that no matter who you are, I would probably say that's a hard no. Um, I got another offer last week and it was, um, you know, it was the company wanted to pay a very small amount for an Instagram post and give me a free product worth about $200. And I said, no, but if that was, if this was five years ago, I probably would have said yes, because that, that time the brand would have had a bigger following than me. And I would have given them some guidelines to help grow my file, you know, how to feature me and how to tag me. And that would have helped grow my following. So I think you have to make different decisions based on where you are in growing your platforms. And so, you know, sometimes you will take that lower pain work to help you get that higher pain work later on. But once you start getting that higher pain work, that's when you kind of have to make those decisions about, okay, maybe, you know, my time is worth more than $4. (laughs) Um, You know, um, I want to make at least this hourly rate or, um, you know, my name recognition, my endorsement is worth, you know, more than $100. It's worth this much. And so you have to think about that. What is the brand getting out of your, um, your endorsement? What is the brand getting out of your work? And that's, you know, it's not even, it's not really, um, you can't think of it in terms of, you know, how much am I making um, even in total, but it's just, you know, if this brand were to hire, um, you know, a celebrity or, you know, someone else, like what would they be paying that person? And obviously we're not all on that, that level, but we're, we're micro influencers and that's worth a lot. Right. No, I, I think, um, you mentioned kind of putting it in context and it's sometimes the context of your business and, you know, for you, um, that I think sometimes it's easy to have a lot of chatter that's outside. And I think it's important to ask, like you mentioned a mastermind or, you know, other people who are more experienced, but that ultimately it always comes down to you making a decision that feels right for you. Um, and sometimes you know, that, that is important. Right? Yeah. And I, I think your gut check is really important. It's going to tell you a lot. And sometimes, like I mentioned earlier, I sleep on it. And sometimes I don't really have a true feeling for what my gut's telling me until, you know, when I wake up, but it's always pretty clear then. Mm-hmm. And your intuition is, you know, it's going to guide you pretty well. Um, but it does help to have mentors, to have other people to ask, not to be afraid to ask those questions, but um And also, you know, just take that advice and then make your own decision. You don't have to do what somebody else tells you to do either. So freelance writing um, is something you brought up before. Um, I guess I want to talk about contracts and I want to talk about getting paid. So if you have a brand and they're interested in, you know, working with you and let's say you're, you're getting started in this area. What does that look like? Do you have your own set contract that you send over? Do you ask them to send? How does that work? How do you even know what to do? Um, Yeah, that's a great question. So, um, so number one, always, always have it in writing, whatever you're agreeing to for, you know, use of your um, name and likeness, which is your endorsement, um, your image that goes along with the product. Um, for the deliverables, for the compensation, for the timeframe of the partnership, always have that in writing. And that can be through a true, you know, 18 page contract. I've gotten those before. That can be through a one page letter of agreement, often called an LOA Um, for really small things. I mean, I don't love doing it, but I've had brands just ask, you know, it's one Instagram post. Can we just have this email stand as a contract? And so you kind of have to use your you know, have you, have I worked with this brand before? Do I trust this brand? You know, you have to go along with that to make that decision. Um, I find that, so I, one of the first things I did early on 
was I hired a lawyer to, um, to make me a contract. And I try, not every brand will say, yes, I'll use your contract, but it saves so much time <laughs> if they will. And I actually sell a version of that agreement on RD to RD. Uh, so you can find that there. And um, so that is helpful. A lot of times though, the brand will have their own legal team put together a contract. And then, um, so, you know, one of those things um, that you're probably gonna wanna think about is how you're going to invest in your business. And one of the best ways to do that is to have an attorney on speed dial. And it's expensive, um, but what I did was I kind of, I tried to learn as much as I could from the attorneys I hired because sometimes there's just all of this legalese and it's so confusing. And so, um, you know, after hiring an attorney say a dozen times to help me with these contracts, there's a lot that I can do myself because I learned. And occasionally I do get that killer 18 page contract and I just hand it over to my attorney because it's, it's a lot. <laughs> and so, um, but you wanna make sure you're not agreeing to anything that isn't, um, if you if you don't understand what you're reading, you might be agreeing to something that you don't wanna be agreeing to, that the brand can use your um, image for the next 10 years and they can advertise with it. And you might find you know your recipe on the box of a cereal box, but you only got paid for this one Instagram post. So you don't wanna be careful of things like that. And that's what a contract will protect you against. That's really good advice. I think the legal elements, sometimes it feels Dicey. I don't want to say dicey to have that conversation, but you don't want to scare them away, right? And I think maybe that's that fear of, um, you know, getting, you know, too caught up in the contract. But I think most established brands, you know, do you find that that's going to scare people away? Yeah, I actually find it to be the opposite. So it's like, it gives you a strange sense of um, just, it's okay. When I say my attorney really has a problem with this clause, it feels and it sounds better and it's better received than to say, I have a problem because then you're making it personal. But if you're just saying, I really want to work with you, but my attorney won't let me sign this contract unless you take the sentence out. It just, it's more professional and it's better received. Got it. Good advice. Um, I'm going to look over here at the little question list. Um, so Sarah here says, she does some freelance writing um, and some PR companies will reach out and ask if they can feature their brand in future articles. So I think this is a common topic, right? How do you handle that? Do you get paid for this kind of partnership? And what do you need to know when it comes to talking to that publication? Yeah, so a lot of brands will kind of ask if they can pitch you out to media to be interviewed, or if they can, um, you know, have you talk about their product in a media interview. And so this is something that you're endorsing that company, you should be getting paid for. It's complicated though. So for one, um, you need to make that clear to the company. If they're pitching your name out to editors and reporters, there needs to be an agreement of how they can use your name of compensation. Um, the other part that's really, really important is disclosure. So on the other side of things, if you say, hey, I really love X cereal and you're talking to a reporter and you say, you know, it's, it's full of fiber and protein and it's super filling, um, you have to say in that interview, um, just FYI, or, you know, I'm a nutrition partner, I'm a spokesperson, I'm a brand ambassador, you know, whatever the official term is for this brand. And then the reporter or the editor will make the decision of, no, that's totally fine. You know, um, we're still going to include you or maybe, you know, there's outlets like US News and Huffington Post, for example, that nine times out of 10, their editorial policies just don't allow mentions that have that kind of partnership. And that's something you kind of just get a feel for as you do these media interviews. Um, you know, I do have clients I do interviews for and I just say, you know, I can't get you a placement in X outlet because it's just not possible. Um, and that's just kind of, um, you know, but I can talk about um, something that I just love because I love it, but I'm not doing a paid partnership with it. <laughs> I see. Got it. You can tell me, yeah, if, if you're getting compensated, then it changes, changes. Yeah. Time. Got it. Um, and I think that question is similar to, um, Lainey had reached out, um, food companies, you know, see an article and ask if they could feature their product in an upcoming article. And I think her question was really around, does the PR agency or the brand pay me to feature the product in an article? Does the brand pay the publication? What's the relationship, I guess she's asking, between the food brand 
the PR agency and you as the freelance writer? Um, who pays who? What's going on? So there's a few different ways this works these days. Um, as we as we get into 2021, there's more and more uh, possibilities out there. So one possibility is that um, there's something called branded content. And so this is when, um, you know, a major news site has a division that's literally called branded content or something similar. And the brand um, say, you know, let's just say like um, Mac computers. That's not obviously what we're talking about, but they have paid, um, you know, Women's Health to do an article about why these kinds of computers are really great. And so um, then they're going to be looking for experts and say they um, the publication is getting paid by the brand, but it's going to say on the article, you know, branded content sponsored by Apple. Um, mm -hmm. So that's one kind of situation. Um, that's something where I would take that case by case. I don't always take those kinds of interviews. If it's, um, I've had something come up where, you know, say I, I'm, par I'm currently partnering with a supplement company and the content is sponsored by a different supplement company. And that just feels like it's not a good idea. So I'll turn that down. So you kind of have to take those case by case. Another possibility is that um, you're getting paid by, you know, X brand. Um, let's say oranges <laughs> to do interviews about oranges and um, say you're a freelance writer and you've got assigned an article about, you know, the top 10 fruits to eat for healthy skin and you want to include a section on oranges. Um, so there's media, media dietitians will have differing opinions about how to handle this. So I will tell you how I would handle it. Um, I find it very, um, difficult to be okay with like double dipping. So, you know, if I'm getting paid by the outlet to write the article and then the brand's paying me to talk about oranges, I don't, I find it conflicting to take both of those handfuls of money. So what I would do in that case, you know, oranges are great. I want to include them in my article. What I would personally do is include them for free, just as a bonus to my orange client and say, hey, I gave you a freebie. But then I'd also tell my editor, hey, I work with oranges, you know, just FYI, you don't have to keep this in, but I truly love oranges. Um, there's other dietitians, like I said, who, you know, there's there's no like truly right, right or wrong way to do this, but you have to be just, you have to disclose. Um, mm. And then there's the just flat out media interview, you know, say the same publication, there's a different author, but that author said, hey, I'm writing this article about fruit. And you say, hey, um, I really love oranges. Right? <laughs> and then, you might be getting paid to do that interview by your orange client and you tell the author, hey, I have this orange client. And then they decide if they keep it in or not. And if they do, you would get paid, but you disclosed. Yes, I feel you know, that whole weaving through here, a lot of disclosure, right? And really yes. thinking through the elements of what feels right to you. Like you mentioned, it doesn't feel right for you to, to what you would say, take two, two handfuls of cash. Um, where maybe somebody else might have a totally different thought process, but that you're thinking it through. So that's, um, I have found that to be really- Yeah, really and then just to, um, the disclosure part, there's actual federal laws that mandate that you need to disclose. And so that isn't a gut check so much as a legal thing that you need to be doing. Right, right. Um, I think being aware of those legal elements that someone just doesn't know, like it's important to know what your responsibilities are. Are there any other um, things like that that people need to be aware of jumping in? Yeah, so a lot of times these will show up in your, if you have a contract um, or the letter of agreement with a brand, a lot of them these days are including, they're, they're called FTC laws um, and they'll include the actual, like they'll spell out exactly how you need to disclose. Um, the other way, uh, is if you share, say, hey, I, hey, everyone, I was on the Today Show talking about oranges, and um, you post that on Instagram, you would need to disclose, you know, either through a hashtag sponsored or, you know, hey, I partnered with oranges to uh, be on the Today Show, you would just need to disclose that in the first three lines of your Instagram post, um, or that early hashtag, or you can do hashtag ad, um, just something so it's super, super clear. Um, there was a trend, it's kind of outdated now, but say like a year ago, people were doing hashtag spawn, S-P-O-N, as an abbreviation for sponsored. And shortcuts like that aren't even allowed anymore. You have to be 100% transparent, really. That makes sense. 
<laughs> we have like short things for everything, right? <laughs> um, yeah, my uh, fifth, well, sixth grade, I can't remember how old my child is. He will answer my questions and like, some kind of gibberish you can like uh, no sorry you're gonna have to give me the full term right. son i do not understand <laughs> so no i get it no abbreviations sometimes um so i want to kind of switch gears ask a fun question what does kind of a work day or a work week look like for you um or you know more in general It'd be fun yeah, I think that's a great question. And my answer is there is no official normal work day. Um, that's truly though what I love about being a dietitian working in the media is I get bored really easily. And if every day was the same, um, I personally would not be okay with that. So <laughs> having every day be totally different. Um, I love it. So, I mean, um, I would say my week right now is not normal because I literally just moved into a new house and we're unpacking. But if it was normal, um, I write anywhere from, you know, one to five articles a week. And so I personally will try and like, I'll try and structure my time that um, I'll set aside time to do the interviews. And then I'll set aside different time to do the writing. And so that might be, you know, two or three hour chunks out of my day where I break it up that way. Um, and then I do recipe development for clients as part of my brand partnerships. And so I try and strategize that out to, you know, the daylight and when things are going to photograph well. So I kind of time that out in the morning. Um, you know, there's a cutoff usually by about three o'clock in the afternoon, I have to be done. So my day might be, um, you know, I try and start my days with a workout. So I might do yoga in the morning or Pilates. And then if I have a recipe, I'll go and do recipe development, take a lunch break. I'll probably eat what I made for my recipe for lunch. And then, um, you know, sit down and do some writing, hammer out a blog post, um, you know, kind of, you know, probably do some social media in between. And then um, I try, I really try very hard to have boundaries. So I try and say, okay, I'm going to go eat dinner with my husband. Um, sometimes I have to go back to work, but I try and at least take that break. Um, I try really hard not to work evenings and weekends, but it's not always, you know, you kind of, if there's a big project, it might not be possible. Um, but I really try and have those priorities of, um, of making time for the important things. Yeah, and I that's like the that. cool part about working for yourself is, um, I can do that yoga class in the morning at, you know, nine o'clock when uh, I probably should be working, but I'm not. Right. <laughs> so. No, I think that ability to structure your day around the tasks or your week around what needs done versus showing up and being, you know, I have to chart on, you know, race around and chart on 15 patients and I don't get any control over what happens. It's it's sometimes scary, but it's freeing. And um, I think it's interesting to hear you talk about it because I can just see, you know, how, how much joy that brings you. Um, it's really, and I think that's the most important part is finding what really brings you happiness. And, um, you know, there's types of media I personally prefer over others. And so, you know, I realize, I don't know if I'm ever gonna have a YouTube channel that's just, um, I, if, unless I hire a whole, whole production team, you know, producing videos is, uh, I wish that was something I loved, um, but it's it's not, so that's fine. I'm more of a writer. Yeah. And, and knowing your lane, right? Knowing what you're good at and what brings you joy. I think we have one more question over here. I'm gonna take a look, because um, I know we're gonna have time. Um, it was back to our comments about oranges. Um, so are you open to speaking to what you, what you might for, for linking to brands in an article like linking to oranges. I'm not sure if you might. Can you repeat that? I'm not sure if Mackenzie, if you were asking about pricing, but are you open to speaking to what you for linking to brands in an article like linking to oranges? I'm not really for sure linking. Ever. So yeah. I'm, if I understand that correctly, which I'm not sure I do. Um, in, like actually including links and in articles. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I mean, a lot of times a brand will ask, you know, can you link back as part of the inclusion in an article, can you link back? And so um, I have some brands who ask to include a picture. And so usually the agreement for um, a nutrition place, uh, media placement is to include the brand name, um, a line of health messaging, at least one message, and uh, sometimes a link and photo. I always try and make the link and photo kind of an, a bonus more than a requirement because that's not something I can guarantee, you know, I understand not getting credit if the nutrition messaging gets cut because then kind of like, what's the point of the placement, but 
a lot of um, a lot of publications these days, like they don't even include backlinks to you know my website, and they're not going to include the backlink to the brand website, and that's just how it is these days. Yeah, exactly. I think that that's sound advice there. Um, how do you set up the contract with the brand to mention them? Do you get paid per mention? A little bit more about that contracting. And yeah, business. so there's types of contracts that are paid. They're called pay per play, where you get paid per mention. And then there's types of contracts where you might have a set of, you know, 10 deliverables where you say, okay, I'm going to do five media interviews on behalf of the brand. I'm going to do two blog posts. I'm going to do three Instagram posts. And then that's just a lump sum. I try and encourage everything to go in the direction of the bigger partnership where um, media interviews are just part of a partnership and not the sole partnership. Um, again, that's a personal decision. I, at this point in my career, don't, um, there's just so many companies that want those, those placements that I find it impossible to say yes to every single one of them because that would require doing like 3000 media interviews a year. And so I have to tell these companies, you know, I would love to work with you in order to work with you. I offer these media placements as a add on to other services, but not as a standalone. And I find that's one way to get your partnerships to increase. So it's great for everyone. And I tell the brand, you know, always make it about what's great for them. I will say something like, you know, this really allows me to get to know your product and all of your messaging because we're working on all of these different types of deliverables together. And so everyone wins because of it. So you want to make it not like whiny, like, I want more money, <laughs> I want more work, but say what is great for them and why they're going to um, really benefit from your full services rather than just one offering. Awesome. Hey, I think like literally, if I could just dive into your brain for about a week, I it would I would come out the other side such, I'd look like Yoda probably too. <laughs> um, just kidding. But um, so much wisdom just from the years of experience that you've been you've been doing this. But I want to make sure that people know about um, some of the resources that you offer. You have some free tip sheets and you also have the Master the Media course, which kind of makes this more manageable. Before we wrap up, can you talk a little bit about the sheets that you offer and how people can learn about your course? Yeah, absolutely. So um, so a fellow dietitian and I, Erin Plinsky-Wade, you probably have seen her do lots of broadcasts and she's written a million books. So we have an e-course called Master the Media and we have a um, 13 continuing edu credit course and a one continuing edu education credit course. They both offer an ethics credit. And the, um, the full course you can find at masterthemedia.co, so not .com, but .co, um, backslash course. Um, it just really features everything you need to know about becoming a media dietitian. We actually um, just made it available so you can buy it now. We used to only offer enrollment just at certain times of the year, but we decided 2020 is weird, so why not just give it to yeah. everyone at any time? But it includes everything you need to know about becoming a freelance writer, about doing media interviews, about doing broadcasts. We even tell you what to wear to pop on TV. Um, we cover, you know, all the ins and outs of social media, of the ethics and disclosure. And um, yeah, it, we just, we've had so much feedback that it really just helps speed you along to where you can become a media dietitian in months and don't, you don't have to spend years and years figuring it out for yourself. Um, and then if you're kind of not ready to take that deep dive, we have our one credit course, um, which is also on our website. It's called the masterclass. And we also have free tip sheets. So if you just click on the free tips drop down, we have tips on um, everything from freelance writing to um, broadcast interviews and more. So those are really great resources. And then literally just yesterday, <laughs> we, we started a Facebook group called um, it's called Media Mastery with Amy and Aaron. So you can just look that up on Facebook. And that's going to be a page where you can just ask literally all the questions you asked during this Facebook Live and we'll answer them and you can get feedback. And it's going to be awesome. Wonderful. I'll definitely uh, link to that uh, uh, after this show. Thank you. Of course. Amy. I really appreciate you coming on today. It was having a little like flashback moment. You, you and Aaron were my first RD to RD live show, literally a little over three years ago. It's so fun to have you back on. I can't believe that was three years ago. Yes, 
three years ago. Um, so lots changed since then, but I really, um, I just think you're a great example of uh, being, you know, a media dietitian and someone who um, you mentioned from the ethics standpoint, the workflow, um, you know, I really think you've got a, a lot to offer and as well as the course that you put together, really taking your knowledge and, and making that available. So thank you for what you do. Of course, thank you so much for having me. It's been so fun. Right. So I wish everyone a great end to your 2020. And um, I guess our next interview will be ah, 2021. Wow. Thanks right. so much. Thanks so much, everyone, for being here. Bye-bye.